Hello, everyone. What a wonderful day, wonderful experience to, to be here at the summit. It's my first one, despite I've been for 10 years a user of Lime. As Thornton said, uh, thank you also to my wife <laughs> to allow me to, to come after a newborn just a week ago. So, yeah, super happy to be here. And I'm going to talk today mainly about a book that we recently published together with, we edited with Roberto Cadilli. And of course, Rosaria was behind the scenes there. Um, which is called Meet Your Customers. Okay? Uh, I wanted to start with a little bit of my story concerning NIME, just to introduce myself. Uh, um, I, in 2012, uh, I started my PhD in Maastricht University 10 years ago. This is almost like a my 10 year anniversary with NIME talk, so particular. So back then in, in Maastricht, I learned about NIME as a platform to data science, and I discovered that it could be very, very useful for my research in marketing. And that's how I started, you know, so most of my early work, first years in NIME, is publishing articles concerning social media content, uh, customer service, uh, and more recently we are working on the development of apps that can help maybe content managers in their design of uh, pieces of posts in social media, like, I mean, what's happening very frequently at the, at the summit recent in, uh, at, at, at this time. Uh, I use NIME also for teaching, so this is somehow the framework that I, I, I use for my course, which involves 12 weeks of teaching marketing analytics, in, and I like that figure because it, it really shows my understanding of NIME as an integrative platform that allows me to teach students with a heavy statistical background or with a heavy programming background or without any background in statistics or programming, right? So it's a, it's a tool that allows me to really uh, I don't know, exploit different capabilities with different uh, platforms. And finally, I've been also working with NIME in, uh, in the development of challenges where students can participate and apply data science to real projects. For example, we, we did in 2020 a challenge together with Roberto and Rosaria in which the winning team developed a, a model that helped them in predicting box office revenue of movies based on posters, on images, right? So based all on machine learning. So very applied player, very successful, and also really interesting. Getting into my talk now. Um, part of my talk, I'm going to use some stats. Uh, I'm from marketing, and I'm going to use the CMO survey, which is the uh, chief marketing office officer survey that happens uh, quarterly. And this, I'm going to show some of the results of the 2023 survey, so very recent. Um, it covers a wide range of sectors, uh, B2B, B2C, uh, clients, etc., different type of businesses, but all of them are uh, like senior manager executives at top, at top companies. And when we think about marketing, um, in the recent years, probably the largest change we have experienced is channels, right? So, bunch of channels, you know, consumers can connect with your company through retail, through face-to-face, -face, through uh, web, through social media, TikTok, reviews, anything, right? So multiple of channels that make the job of any marketer more complex, more difficult, right? Of course, social media probably is the, the biggest one there. Um, and if I, I know not all, not, not all of you are in marketing, so a brief question, what's the role of marketing in a company? What's the primary role of marketing in any company? Thoughts? Selling products, right? Okay, that's, that's one of the main ones. Here I included a list of the main things that a marketer thinks that is the role of marketing in their company. And you will see that in March 2023, so very recently, what we see that the main job of any marketer uh, is the brand, right? The brand, promotion, advertising, a lot of communication, right? So that's the first one. But we also start seeing at the bottom, uh, and, and so these are all just top things that marketing's, marketers have to do. We see marketing analytics, marketing research, insights, and competitive intelligence. So two things. First, marketing in your organization is probably in charge of creating value, adding value to product or services through different communicational channels. That's one. But at the same time, marketers nowadays are ask and require to measure the value that is being created by these product services and communication, right? So that's, that's to me, it's one of the biggest channel challenges recently. And what we see too is that the ones 
The activities with the largest increase in the recent years are involving marketing analytics and marketing research, right, from, from February 2020 to March 2023. So, and I see it from my students too. When they go to find a job, they are required more quantitative skills concerning, you know, how to measure the value of marketing. But there is always a but here, right? So uh, if you ask uh, also companies where they are prepared or not to implement analytics in their companies and to measure the value of marketing, not really good, right? So from one to seven, we are at an average of 4.1, which is kind of in the middle. There is still a lot of scope to grow in how we can use analytics for marketing. So that was my gap. That's the gap in my presentation, and that's where I think there is job to be done, you know. Marketing professionals need, you know, some good training in marketing research, statistics, machine learning, uh, app building, scraping data, and it's becoming, I don't know, time little by little more pressing, uh, a pressing need, right? So for professors, this is not, easy, not that easy, you know. It sounds easier than it is, you know. It's, uh, and for students too, uh, by default, I will say, marketing students maybe are not necessarily more prepared for the challenges uh, involved in, uh, in data science, right? So they are more on the creative side of, side of things. They, they are not necessarily much into programming, so you need to drag them in. And this is where our book enters, meet the customers, right? So uh, that's the gap that our book tries to fill in. Uh, it's the result of three years of collaboration with Rosaria and Roberto. Roberto and I uh, co-edited the book, so thanks, Roberto. It has been really a wonderful experience working with you. And, and in the book, uh, it started with an article that we uh, got published in the Journal of Business Research. And in this article, we created a repository of marketing analytic projects um, that uh, anyone could use, researchers, practitioners, and they, they were about sentiment analysis, uh, search engine optimization, etc. Because it was kind of going well, there were every time that every month, I will say, we think in a new project, we were doing stuff, we say, okay, let's do a book. And that was the result, you know. Uh, from a paper to a repository, we end up with a book. And I think we're already considering the volume two. So uh, the books are actually upstairs. You can find a copy for free if you're interested. Um, and the rationale behind the book, right? So there is no book without any rationale. Otherwise, I guess I would be a a professor as by profession. So marketing uh, is activities, right? In marketing, we do activities, pricing, segmentation, communication. We do things that have an impact, ideally, in the customer. That's the main idea. We do marketing because we want profit, maybe, or we want societal impact. We don't do marketing by, by itself. But once again, nowadays, we have the challenge of data, so data protection and privacy, because we have more data from our customers. And we have all this beautiful in the middle, you know? Because it's not that we go from a marketing activity to profit one direction straight away, nothing in the middle. But things happen in between. There are customer perceptions, customer behavior, like perceptions such as brand, uh, behavior such as conversion rates, uh, product and market impact, uh, like market share, and there is customer level performance like customer lifetime value, right? So those things happen. And that's the focus of the book, right? The direct impact of marketing on those, uh, on those measurements. The book is divided in seven chapters. I'm not going to go in detail on, on each of them, but this is just to throw you, to give you an overview of the seven chapters. And in this presentation, I will focus in, in three. Uh, chapter, so customer mindset and metrics, and I'll give an example of brand reputation. I'm going to give an example of customer behavior uh, applications. And finally, other analytics, I'm going to show something about image analysis. This is another slide that I like because it shows, in a nutshell, the, the, actually the quite some things that the book does. <laughs> it's uh, data. From a data perspective, the book includes demographics, call centers, purchase behavior, churn, anal Google Analytics data, views, clicks, purchase, price, uh, Google search en engine results, tweets, and images. So from a data perspective, it's very rich, and structured and structured data. 
from a model perspective, statistical models, machine learning, natural language processing, it includes include traditional methods concerning regression, ANOVA, it includes advanced, let's say, machine learning techniques, support vector machines, it includes deep learning, language models, you know, so also a wide range of, of algorithms. And finally, integrations, you know, it shows integrations with SQL, with SAP, with Spark, Twitter API, the Keras Deep Learning, the Color API, Google Cloud Vision, R, and Python. So, so it's, a, it's a, I mean, for 200 pages, it has quite some content. Um, let's start with case one, brand reputation, right? Why that image? Because brand reputation happens mainly nowadays in digital channels, right? That's where we can see what customers are talking about our brand or feeling about our brand, thinking about it, right? Um, and what's the main reason then for using social media? Why Nime actually is posting so much in social media recently? Why? What's the main reason of posting in social media about this event and the things that Nime is doing? Probably brand building, right? Probably we want to build a brand about Nime, right? We want to make Nime great more awareness about Nime, right? I'm a Nimer and I really want more people to know about it. It's a wonderful platform and people should know, people should use it and people should like develop projects about it, right? So what's the problem? Always a but. Organizations in general uh, spend the least of their time measuring aspects about the brand. So they measure everything, sales, they measure digital performance, content engagement, lead, but they don't measure brand value. They don't measure actually what the brand is doing for them, you know, and how the brand is looking, is healthy or not. And that's kind of the, the project that I'll present is the brand reputation tracker. It's actually a replication of a project that was published in a marketing journal in 2021. And brand reputation is defined as the overall impression of how stakeholders think, feel, and talk about the brand. This is typically because of brand events with an effect on financial performance. There are three main components of a brand, uh, of, 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 of like brand reputation, value equity, brand equity, and relationship equity. You know? The value equity is functional. The brand equity is more feeling-based, emotional. And the relationship equity is concerning the community around a brand. How do we play it, put it in action in social media data, which is mainly about text? So in the, in the article that this, this, this tool is based, uh, they develop lexicons. You know, lexicons, for example, for the brand driver that involves four sub-drivers, how, how cool is a brand, how exciting it is, how innovative, and how socially responsible. And they develop lexicons, dictionaries that describe, you know, whether a brand is, is cool in the positive side or whether a brand is cool in the negative side. So something like ordinary, lame, ancient, old, something like that. And that's what we try to implement in our workflow. So we wanted to increase the accessibility to this tool. And this is the workflow of the replication, of the brand reputation tracker in Nime. I will say it has two key components. Uh, the first one is the Twitter integration that allows users or anyone to just collect data from Twitter directly. Uh, about any mention concerning a brand, let's say Amazon call it. And the second key thing about this workflow is the text mining dictionaries, which is super simple. You know, it's actually identifying the words that relate with each of these attributes, coolness, excitement, etc. right? And it happens in that meta node that says dictionary, uh, text mining dictionaries, right? Then we can measure hourly, daily, weekly, monthly, or yearly, how a brand is perceived in each of those attributes. You are able to decide through the workflow whether you are interested in a, in a measurement that is hourly, weekly, the, the time frame that you are interested in. Let's think about Dior. This is a case uh, I, I used to do in class. We did recently this year with, with, uh, with Constantine right there. Um, and the brand Dior, we, gave, we asked students to collect data about Dior, you know, during all 2022. And this is more, like, more or less how it looks, the Dior brand concerning the brand driver, right? You see a blue line relates with coolness, the yellow, innovativeness, a red is exciting, 
and Brownie societal responsibility. Right? And that's how the brand Dior evolved weekly in all 2022. Probably it might get your attention the peaks that we see on that graph, right? There are two, two peaks, one low and one high. What happened there? Well, by the end of July, Dior was accused of culturally appropriating centuries of an old Chinese skirt. It was a chaos, you know, it was like a brand scandal. A lot of chatting about Dior. And that affected the innovative uh, sub-driver of brand, right? So if you are a marketer, you are... By July, you should be concerned about the innovative component of your brand. How can you tackle an innovation problem, per innovative perception problem about your brand? That's one case, one example. But what we also show students that in the positive peak, for example, which is about excitement, there was a, one of the most important, let's say, shows, runaway shows that Dior did in Paris that year, right? And there was a lot of chat about the brand Dior in social media concerning excitement about the brand. So that's an application of the brand reputation workflow. Second case, marketing attribution. One of the biggest problems in the industry, at least we talk about, and, and concert channels. Again, I started the presentation talking about channels. So many channels, but which one is the one that did the job? Which channel is the one that got the sale accomplished? Right? That's the big question that marketers have. Shall I invest in SEO, email marketing, banners, or events like these ones, or TV? Right? How do I take those decisions? Um, and there are different methods to do so. Uh, one is touch-based attribution, in which you say it's going to be the first channel that connected with the customer, or maybe it's going to be the last channel that the customer used before buying our product. Uh, there are logistic regression models to do so. Chaplet value, which consists uh, in a method that what would happen if you remove one of the challenge? What, how the probability of purchasing will increase or improve? Um, random field experiments, uh, A-B testing somehow. Some uh, customers randomly chosen will receive a promotion, some not. You know, what will be the effect of the promotion? And finally, Markov chain model, which is a more advanced, let's say, algorithm to assess if a sequence of events had an impact on a customer. We created a workflow for it. This was one of my students who actually did an internship in NIME last year, uh, Anthony. And in this workflow, once again, one of the things I like about NIME is how beautiful things look. I mean, this is brand attribution modeling, which it sounds complicated, difficult, but this workflow, yeah, maybe it looks complicated too, but looks beautiful, <laughs> you know? And, and it, 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 in each of those rectangles, what you see is that we see descriptive statistics, like that's the focus of it. We also see the use of basic touch-based attribution models, correlation and regression models, Shapley value, randomized experiments, and each one of those meta nodes is doing exactly that, you know, assessing that method, assessing that problem with data. And finally, a dashboard that includes visualizations. And here I'm just going to leave you with images of how the visualizations look. So we can get the total occurrences per channel, so very descriptive, you know. We can see a direct visit to this website where the most popular, followed by brand impressions. The last kind of recurrent channel was email in this case. We can also see the Shapley value table, uh, which shows you what's the probability, how the conversion probability changes if we remove one channel, right? So it, it, and, and that's the, the percentages that we have. So we can know exactly, okay, if we remove email channel from our, our journey, our conversion probability is going to stay the same. Okay, then we can remove email, right? And finally, this is an, a, a visualization that happens through an R integration, right? With this, with this project, for example, we discovered that, okay, with NIME, we cannot include error bar charts in the graph. Okay, let's do it in R within NIME. And we did it. That's, again, one of the things I appreciate NIME, you know, the ability to integrate with other tools. And it shows us that uh, in which, uh, and this is an experiment that shows that it's more effective if we have a banner that of the company and that banner is seen, that's when we have the highest impact on conversion. Final case, uh, image analysis. 
Content is becoming more visual than ever, right? It's not anymore about text, you just look at TikTok. Uh, and we are facing in marketing a heavy, heavy competition for attention, right? We are all scrolling our phones, no time for think to think, but some things that need to catch our attention fast. And, and, and of course, companies are spending a lot of money in understanding what to post, which image shall I invest? This was Roberto's work. Uh, this is the Google Cloud Vision uh, workflow somehow. Um, at the bottom of the workflow, you are allowed to retrieve images, a batch of images from your laptop, or they can be from a new URL. Um, and then the top part of the workflow connects you with the Google Cloud Vision API, which will uh, automatically you know, measure some aspects of images, of batches of images. Finally, you will get, once again, uh, some visualizations about it. This is more, more or less how your data will start looking like. You will have your images, and those images will, be, uh, will have information about the color that they have, which color concentration might be more useful for your company. Okay, your company is very much into yellow. Nime is very much into yellow. Is yellow paying off to Nime? Uh, let's see, we can assess it in our pictures, right? Uh, and we can also, also get information about what uh, features are included in the images, what objects, so label recognition, which can inform us about elements that might be more interesting for our audiences. Right? And then, of course, the, the visualization, right? We can get visualization about image features that are in each of these pictures, uh, dominant colors in this batch of pictures, you know, the, the frequencies, and finally, the label topicality. What are the main topics? through our images. This is super interesting. So what we are seeing, maybe, of you, maybe some of you are familiar, but in marketing, we used to have this very popular method, which was called SETMET. Maybe anyone is familiar with it. And SETMET, it, it involved like bringing or asking a bunch of customers to come one day to, let's say, the office and bring pictures about the brand. And then there will be some qualitative analysis of the pictures. Well, now we can do this with Digital, right? So we can ask consumers, you know, a bunch of consumers to just uh, drag and drop images, you know, log online to uh, upload their images that they think relate to a brand. And we can do the exact analysis of images using deep learning from Google Cloud Vision, right? So it's a very good application if, if someone would be interested in content marketing in, uh, with visuals. Um, and those are the three main cases I wanted to show, but uh, at the same time, we are already thinking in the volume two, as I said, of the book. And, and one project that I'm particularly working that connects research with, uh, with, with also an application, with business, is this image dynamism project, right? And the image dynamism project starts from the idea that uh, overall, we know from science that dynamic images, so images that depict some movement, are more effective in catching attention than images that are static. So more or less like this, right? So whenever we see something that is moving, it's going to trigger more or attention or more or uh, elaboration than something that is static. Right? So we developed a, a, here a, a machine, a deep learning model. We this is part of the research project. We annotated more than 8,000 images, developed a model that was able to predict the probability of an image being dynamic. Right? And this is the workflow that does it. But beyond the workflow that, that does that part, uh, we collaborated in a project with Paolo, Paolo Tamagini, who is here too, uh, which is part of this image dynamism in which the question was concerning overlays within an image. So it's very popular nowadays that you post something online and you put some text on top of the image, right? And, and you have to color that text or decide where it goes. So in this project, the question was, okay, how can we help marketers to know where to place an overlay and how big it should be? Right? So a simple question. And we, we developed this app, or he developed this app, <laughs> most of him, so thanks, Paolo. Thank you very much for your attention. It's been a pleasure and yeah, happy to receive any question.